E-bikes also, importantly, allow people to exist without a car. I do know people who have sold a car because they've gotten two e-bikes or people who don't have a car because they have e-bikes. And that probably saves them a lot of money and allows them, first of all, more choices on where to live because they don't then have to worry about parking so much. And it allows them to have a bit more flexibility in their budget because they're not paying for car insurance or gas or fueling or whatever the, the various associated costs are. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. My name is John Zimmerman and that is Bryn Grunwald from RMI in Boulder, Colorado. And we're gonna be talking about e-bikes and the e-bike calculator, the benefits calculator that they have come up with there at RMI. Let's get right to it with Bryn. Bryn, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me here today. It's a great honor. Well, I uh, am super stoked to chat with you. Uh, you are my second RMI person to, to have on. Uh, I, I did have been uh, Holland on the audio only version uh, many, many years ago. Or I shouldn't say many years ago, a couple years ago. Anyways, in fact, I was in Boulder and, and we did that uh, uh, that interview in person. So that was a lot of fun. But why don't I have you just kind of give a real quick uh, snapshot uh, introduction. Who is Bren? Well, my name is Bryn Grunwald. I am a senior associate on RMI's carbon-free transportation team, where I do a lot of work primarily around e-bikes, micromobility more broadly, and shifting people out of car trips and onto other forms of transportation. I'm from Boulder, Colorado, and I continue to live in Boulder, Colorado, where I think it's a great example of micromobility broadly because Boulder makes it a very easy place to not have to own multiple vehicles. My partner and I each own an e-bike and share a car, a 2010 Toyota Camry, and we're able to get around pretty well with that, uh, which I think has represented a lot of savings and just also options to the two of us. More broadly, I'm into a lot of things like hiking, reading, and just generally being pretty active. So this kind of podcast is great for that kind of discussion. Fantastic. That's great. And uh, yeah, that's all. I, I'm always uh, fascinated and uh, delighted to interview people who are from the Boulder area. And, uh, and and you and I you know, were talking about this before we hit the record button that I used to live in Boulder. I was there in the mid 1990s to uh, just about 2004. 2005 ish uh, before moving to Hawaii. But um, talk a little bit about that growing up in on the Front Range area there in Boulder. And uh, you, you mentioned before we hit the record button that, yeah, you you still get around all the time by bike and uh, originally acoustic bike and then now an e bike. So what was it like uh, growing up there? Honestly, for me, it was really nice. Boulder has a lot of off the road bike paths. And I think that, I mean, now we know a lot more about the right types of bike lanes and whatnot, but growing up, Boulder was sort of the leader in terms of bike lanes. And it was really easy to get around. This isn't a very huge town. It's about 25 square miles. So it's pretty easy to bike from one end to another, which I think represented a lot of options to allow young Bryn little baby Bryn, to explore. So starting from like age 12 onwards during the summer, I would just take my my bike, an acoustic bike. It was a Trek bike. Uh, and I would just sort of bike off by myself, right? Like I had a little Nokia phone. It was one of those that could survive being hit with a sledgehammer and be okay. And I would take 20 bucks and then I would just go to the library for the, the whole day and then bike around. When I went to high school, I went to high school in another town. So I would have to go catch the bus at about... 6.50 in the morning to be able to make it. But as I had a single dad, he had to deal with my younger siblings. So I would bike myself over to the bus stop, catch the bus, take my bike out, and then uh, manage getting home by myself. And this had a lot of, I think, great uh, consequences for me. Consequences isn't quite the right word. Benefits. I had a great mental map of Boulder from a very young age. It was pretty easy for me to figure out, well, I'm here and I need to get here. What's the best ways to do that? And then I also had a lot of independence. And I think it really 
I kind of uh, like growing up, I then watched the show Old Enough, and I kind of felt like this was the most American version of Old Enough because as I had a single dad, sometimes it was really valuable that I could bike off by myself, even as a, a middle schooler, to go do things because my dad could then be like, Hey, I'll give you some money. Can you go by the grocery store and pick up milk or something we need for dinner? And I would be able to go do that. And as I got older, this worked out for going to high school. It worked out for running uh, errands for myself that I needed to run or when I like as I got even older, going to my own doctor and dentist program or appointments by myself. I found it so easy to get around by a combo of bike and bus, actually, that I didn't really bother even thinking about getting my driver's license until I was about 21. I was pretty actively anti getting my driver's license. I really did not want to do it. And then I got my my partner and I was like, I probably need to learn to drive so we can go on dates together. <laughs> well, you could. I mean, you know, the, the era of uh, especially with e-bikes, which we're going to talk about uh, quite extensively in a little bit. The era of uh, e-bike dates are is really starting to proliferate. And uh, I know we are our, our particular e-cargo bike. Uh, we have it configured so that there's a, an extra seat in the back. And so, you know. I could always yeah. put my partner, Laura, on the back and say, OK, let's go. Let's go out to dinner. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, at the time, it was a star-crossed love because I lived in Boulder. And he lived out in Erie, which uh, Erie is another small town, which doesn't really have great bike access. So I was like, well, if I want to see this part- person, guess I have to drive. <laughs> so yeah. uh, that, that is how transit makes or, or that is how a lack of quality transit makes love hard. Yeah. Yeah. So I pulled up the uh, the map of Boulder on screen here to, to give the viewing audience just a little bit of a, a, a of a visual to uh, the fact that, yes, uh, you know, Boulder, I think the joke has always been that, you know, it's like this, uh, you know, whatever it is, 25 square miles or whatever, you know, surrounded by rea- in, in a bubble surrounded by reality. And but in reality, uh, you know, Boulder One of the things that they did was they had, uh, you know, a a development boundary line uh, that sort of went around the entire city. They I think at the time they called it a blue line um, in, in the city limits, as we see it here, represented in the contiguous area here in the red uh, hatch mark really is sort of that development you know, line, which has put constraints on the amount of housing, certainly. And then, of course, you add on a layer of um, uh, zoning codes and all that. It puts even more pressure on uh, uh, affordable housing and all that sort of stuff. But to the point, to your point, because it's not very big, you can get from, you know, from top to bottom, which is the longest length of of the city you know, on an easy bike ride, it's not that hard to do. And, uh, it, and whether it's a, an acoustic bike or an electric bike, it's, it's very, very doable. What I think is so cool about your story though, too, and I can attest that this is, this is a real thing because I lived there for a decade and I spend a couple months in Boulder every year. I, I spend a lot of time in Boulder and have, uh, even when I've moved away is that yes, the kids, use transit. They totally do. When I jump on the bus, because sometimes I'll be in town and won't have access to a car, I'll just have my bike with me. But if I need to go somewhere by bus, I jump on the bus and I'm like, oh, look at this. I've got middle school kids. I got high school kids. I got college kids on the bus, RTD, getting around town. They have a couple of the bus lines that are named fun things like the hop and the skip and the jump and all that. Talk a little more about that, because I think that that's that's a really important factor that you brought up is that you started navigating your city and understanding and there's a certain amount of self-efficacy that gets built and confidence that gets built for, you know, a young adult (laughs) getting into the young adult stage of being able to get around by yourself. Yeah, I think that when you have a system where people are very dependent on cars to get around, right? Like, and we know a lot of car trips are pretty short, but there's a lot of factors that make cars sort of the default option, right? Lack of sidewalks, fear for safety in terms of getting somewhere. It really stunts kids' abilities and older folks' abilities to make independent choices for how they're going to spend their time. And when you're a caretaker, that puts a lot of burden on you because then you're the person who has to 
take the people somewhere. And it doesn't necessarily matter if it's incredibly close, right? Like there's a lot of things that can make car traffic really slow. A buildup, for example, people getting into accidents, sudden squalls of bad weather like we just recently had in Colorado, uh, potholes because people tend to then try to drive to avoid the potholes so they don't damage their tires. And I think when you have a system that is, first of all, very easy to set up, right, where people can understand where to go, it's clearly labeled, and then also a culture of safety and also a normalization of people using transit as a default means to get around, what you get is a lot more independence from people and that sort of innate self-reliance that they can figure out where to go. I remember one time when I was interning in DC talking to a coworker about her difficulty because she had to sprint home to get her kids to, to class. And that was kind of odd to me because I was like, DC has a great transit system. And she was like, yeah. yeah, but I would never let my kids go on that alone, which was interesting to me because I rode the bus by myself with my younger siblings when I was in middle school. And Boulder historically has been a very safe area with I think you can have your complaints about RTD. The bus system for a lot of my life has been pretty good. You're able to get where you need to go with a combination of walking and biking. And I think that builds out a mental map of where to go. It helps kids understand where they can spend their time, right? They can go to the rec center, for example, to go to their gymnastics class or go swimming. They can go downtown to go to the library. They can go with their friends to the comic book store and like spend a few hours there. And I think it is a really vital component for children to build that sense of independence and knowledge of getting around. But I think it's also really great for older people who might not be able to drive or people who are disabled to be able to get around because otherwise they are often limited from making their own decisions on spending their time because they're self-reliant uh, on people c catering to them basically and being able to do that. And I think that that can be really frustrating because American culture is one that really prioritizes independence and the ability to decide what to do with your own time. So if you're older, for example, like having a reliable transit system with the buses that can go down or up or like have paratransit, that's really valuable for making sure that people are not as lonely and really integrated into the world as well. Yeah. Yeah. And you bring up a really good point too of, you know, really channeling that it's not just good for kids. It's also good for everybody across a, a wide variety of, of age groups. Uh, and in fact, depending on the city and the situation, somewhere around 40% of the entire population of a city is somebody who doesn't drive for one reason or another. It could be health. It could be, you know, they've aged out of being able to safely drive. Uh, it could be that they, you know, are just too young, <laughs> like we were talking about. Uh, and so there's lots of different reasons why, um, as well as, uh, as Kathy Tuttle, uh, likes to say a, a past guest on the, on the podcast, you know, some are, are doing it. They're choosing not to drive. They've made an intentional choice not to drive for a variety of reasons. And so, we do sort of have that, you know, reality that you know, a rather significant number of people, you know, may just not be able to drive or choose not to drive. I want to I was lingering on this because the other thing that you mentioned that was fun that you channeled was the network of off street uh, pathways. And that is really, I think, one of the key uh strengths that the city of Boulder has is this wonderful network of off-street uh, cycle paths and multi-use paths. And they follow along the riparian, you know, the creeks, you know, creek beds and, and all that uh, in various areas. And so we see that we've got a whole bunch of the, the dark green uh, following those those riparian corridors. And, uh, and we also know that we're challenged by some of the, and, and by the way, the, since the water is, is flowing basically west to east, most of the, most of these pathways are going from west to east. And we're challenged there in Boulder by having really high quality north-south routes, uh, you know, especially within the street right of way. And that's one of the really big challenges that the city of Boulder has had over the years is how to get high quality on street 
protected bikeways, all ages and abilities facilities uh, into the environment. And so people are, are like, oh, Boulder, it's got to be perfect. And it's like, well, no, it's not perfect. We've got lots of challenges there, but they're working on it. And the city is intentionally working through that process uh, to be able to do that so that, you know, truly, because as a kid growing up and as, as a young professional, you know, you want to be able to get on your bike and get to your meaningful destination and feel like you have a safe route to do so. If you've got that safe route to do so, then you can make that decision. Okay, do I ride a regular bike? Do I ride an e-bike? You can, you can start becoming empowered pardon the pun on that, <laughs> to, to actually, uh, you know, go about your daily life without having to, in your case, and in my case, you know, drive an aging internal combustion engine vehicle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, Boulder is definitely getting better. I think a challenge is, and there's been a couple of papers about this recently, people, I think, eventually do see the benefit of bike infrastructure, especially productive bike infrastructure. There's a lot of people, as we've talked about earlier, who are just taking short trips, right? They're just trying to go to the grocery store and or maybe just going out to pick up a snack or something. And they don't often need to go very far, but that every person that's on the, the, the road in a car is a large amount of space. And in this country, a lot of people take those trips in their car by themselves. It's, that's why we have all these campaigns to do carpooling. And that does add to that traffic congestion, right? You have more people on the road, you have more people trying to get through the stoplights, you have more people waiting at the stop signs. And inherently, there's just not a ton of efficiency gains you can make at a point. And we also know that you can't widen the roads. That doesn't actually help problems um, because of the concept of induced demand. So instead, if you can offer people who are taking those shorter trips a quicker, more convenient, and I would argue more fun way of getting to their destination, then a lot of them, I think, will take it. Not everybody. I don't think everybody wants to bike, but as we've discussed, not everybody wants to or can drive. And so getting even like 15% of cars off the road all of a sudden means that you're going a lot faster, even if the uh, road is a little bit more narrow because all of a sudden you've protected that bike lane so people are much more secure making that decision. There's been some great work looking at willingness to cycle and I think a majority of people are interested in cycling, but have legitimate safety concerns. Not a lot of people want to do the vehicular cycling where they're basically acting as a car, but on a bike. And so the more we protect people, give them the option to make it a safe way of doing it and say, this is going to be fun. This will save you money. And it's not going to be any more difficult. I think that eventually that will bleed over into the people who see, oh, we built this protective bike lane, but all of a sudden my wait time went down by two minutes. Uh, I'm all of a sudden able to get through this traffic light that I think has a great impact on people that especially with like, because people are more willing to bike uh, more often and farther when they have an e-bike that really does help get people off the roads and into other modes of transportation, making space for the people who are continuing to drive or taking a bus or some other mode where they're in the road in a vehicle that has some sort of stronger engine. Yeah. And uh, you, you shared the, the the statistic of, you know, of a fairly, you know, significant number of trips are in fact short trips. And this is the data from two, 2021. Uh, and yeah, I mean, that's the real opportunity that we have is we've got a tremendous number of trips. And again, we're not talking about commute here, folks. We're not saying the commute trip. We're saying trips share of trips. And you mentioned it, you know, going to the grocery store, going to uh, out to, to meet somebody, you know, running errands, et cetera. These are trips. And, you know, maybe some of these trips are trip chaining where you do one trip and then you, you go to a different destination, then you go to a different destination. And that's really, I think, where we start to get into some of the magic of being able to legitimately use the bicycle to be able to open up that world of doing some of these shorter trips, even more empowering in my mind and, and more convenient because of a sense of agency that you have to control your own schedule than transit necessarily. I see transit being super, super powerful for a lot of those sort of routine trips that we're doing. Like for instance, when I lived in Boulder, I, I worked in downtown Denver. And so I would you know, every day get on what was then called the Boulder Express and ride from my nearest, uh, you know, 
bus stop, which was a walking distance from my home, uh, and then make it down to what was then the Market Street Station and then walk the rest of the way to my office, which was in one of the uh, was like on the 38th floor of one of the towers down there. But yeah, so I mean, that's one of the things that is so exciting about this new sort of, and I say new in quotations and scare quotes here, opportunity with the e-bike is that it empowers, I think, more and more of these short trips to be handled uh, for these daily trips. Yeah, it really overcomes that barrier where you're confronted with a hill and you're wearing a nice shirt and you're like, oh, I don't want to bike up that and sweat. But all of a sudden, if you have an e-bike, you can just kick up the power and you can get up that hill, no problem. It also makes it much easier to haul things, right? Which is a result of trip training, right? When, you, when you're when you doing trip training, often what you're doing is running a bunch of errands in sequence. So for example, you're going to the library, you're picking up groceries for dinner, and then maybe you're picking up something from, I don't know, another store along the way home. If you have the ability with a bike to be able to haul all that easily, I think that that becomes a lot more promising, which if you have a, an acoustic cycle, it's definitely a bit more of a workout. But if you have an e-bike, you can just address the power upwards and account for that. So I think it really reduces that barrier to being able to handle it, which I think is a really powerful thing. E-bikes or biking has often been one of those things where you're, especially in Boulder, where you're, you're viewed as being an exercise fanatic and somebody who's really in shape. And I think that when I'm on my e-bike, I don't really view it as be exercising, although that is a nice uh, side benefit of it. <laughs> um, I view it as I'm trying to get somewhere. And just because I don't have a second car, and usually my fiance has the other one. And because Boulder has so many off the road bike paths, and often I'm going to places where I specifically hate the parking lot, like Trader Joe's, it is faster and easier for me to just handle it by a bike, especially because in Boulder, a lot of buildings are required, it's in the building code, are required to have bike parking nearby. So I think especially in hand with building out solid bike infrastructure that feels safe and reliable to people, if we provide bike infrastructure for parking your bike that's right by a shop, also near a security camera, so that way people have uh, less fear of them getting stolen, for example, that all of a sudden becomes a lot more feasible of an option because when I go to Whole Foods, I can pull straight up to the bike rack. I know there's always space versus when I have to deal with the parking lot, it just turns into a slurry of stress and fear. Right. Because yeah, that parking yeah. lot is designed confusingly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually glad you mentioned uh, Whole Foods there in, in Boulder because, it, I, and that's where I shop here locally too. I mean, I happen to ride my bike. I, I live very close to the Whole, Fo- Whole Foods World Headquarters, so the, the oh, flagship wow. store. And, uh, and and I love it too because there's a, a wonderful uh, bike rack that's right up front that is almost always available for me. And so I pull right up and, and, and park there. Uh, but the parking there in um, at Whole Foods, uh, in, in many of the, the different grocery stores that they have in Boulder, oftentimes the, the bike parking is prominently right up front. In, in many cases, there's also a fix-it station there, uh, a bike map there of the, the bike network uh, in the city. Uh, it, the same in Austin here, they, they have that prominently featured. So they're leaning into that, which is a great example of a bike-friendly city or a bike-friendly company that's like encouraging their patrons to actually show up by bike. We're going to have convenient bike parking. We're going to have some amenities for you and some facilities for you to try to encourage that. And the security to your point is, is that they're also very visible. These racks are not just tucked away around the corner somewhere where if you're locking up a, a an expensive e-bike, you might be like, Oh my gosh, I'm, this is, gonna, is it going to be there when I get back? You know, it's around this dark and, and scary corner where, you know, something nefarious might happen to the bike while you're in shopping. No, it's right there. It's very visible. And I think that's a, a very good point. So we've got your landing page for RMI right up here on, on the front. We uh, did just a, a, a quick introduction to it, but why don't you give a, a little bit of a 30,000 foot you know, snapshot of the organization itself. And we'll, we'll dive into, you know, a little bit of the work that you all are doing there. 
Sure. RMI started in the 1980s by Amory Lovins, and he produced a lot of work that basically said energy efficiency is an undervalued tool and we should be trying to do more to take the climate crisis seriously. We now have 600 plus employees spanning a variety of teams. We work on everything from climate aligned industry to the electricity sector to internationally and essentially our goal is to accelerate the clean energy transition to keep in line with the Paris Climate Accord Agreement of staying at 1.5 degrees Celsius. So there's a bunch of levers that we're trying to pull for that. So everything from working on policy to tools to financing across geographies. So everywhere from the U.S. to China to uh, countries in Africa, such as Nigeria. And this touches on a bunch of industries, right? Uh, electricity, transportation, manufacturing, all these various things. We are doing quite a lot of work to accelerate the shift away from old technologies and towards new ones in an equitable and clean manner. Yeah. And I pulled up the, uh, the our work tab. And so there's a couple of, uh, uh, of tabs on here that I really hone in on uh, from an active transportation and an active towns perspective. And that is obviously the carbon free transportation sector. And then also the urban transformation section is is areas where I'm super, super excited about. And uh, we'll, we'll click on the, the, the carbon-free transportation here because this is kind of where uh, you're housed and the studies that you guys are, are looking into and the research that you guys are working on in looking at what we need to do to, to you know, do what we were just talking about is, you know, seeing what we can do to have a little bit of a mode shift on some of those short trips. Can't Are these good opportunities to get them uh, transferred over to a more... Uh, you know, a, a carbon-free transportation solution. Yeah, we do a ton of work across a bunch of different transportation sectors. So trucking is a big one. We also look at how do you electrify passenger fleets and how do you build out the uh, infrastructure for EVs with a particular focus right now and interest in how do you expand their development at multifamily housing, right? So if you live in an apartment complex, how do you handle the issues of charging there? Uh, we also do a lot of work with e-bikes now and looking at how do we cut vehicle use because an e-bike consumes a uh, much less power. So electrifying vehicles is very important. This is something we have to do. However, we have past analysis that shows that if we want to keep to the Paris Climate Accord Accords at the rate that we're going, we not only need to continually electrify our fleet while cleaning up the grid and making sure they run off of clean power, but we also need to reduce the amount that people drive, right? Power still produces uh, the, it, the power still consumes uh, natural gas right now, coal, all these other things. And so every little bit that you can reduce is really valuable. E-bikes, because they weigh much less than cars and because they take so few materials to produce, are incredibly efficient. NREL put out a study last year, I believe, that found that e-bikes produce 99% fewer operational emissions than a gas car per mile. So I don't think that this is going to solve all transportation problems, right? Nobody's going to be biking 30 miles to their Costco one way. Um, well, one person might do that. But uh, I think for a lot of people, it is going to be this proportion of short trips. And that's going to have a huge benefit for their finances, but also for the climate, because it is such a less intensive me means. And it will also allow us to build out the grid in a more safe and reliable way. E-bikes just don't take as much power. And they, again, they can't get you as far, but for the short trips, you don't necessarily need as much power. Yeah. Yeah. And I pulled up a, a couple of different posts here. Um, so we'll, we'll include the links uh, to all of these, uh, these documents uh, in the show notes uh, for the audio only version of this episode, as well as in the video description below um, here on YouTube. Um, and so folks, you can dive into some of these uh, additional uh, documents and, and get to uh, some of the research as well as uh, this, these particular blog post, uh, you sort of channeled a little bit of the impact on, um, uh, on, you know, 
emissions and, and things of that nature. And we, we do know, and, and this is what's being mentioned right here uh, in, on, under point two, is the assessing the impact specifically of uh, looking at the city e-bike and center program and, and the various things and really getting to the, the sort of the, 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 ba- the benefits that we see from an emissions perspective. And um, because one of the things I like to say here on the channel is that, yes, we need to electrify the, the motor vehicle fleet, but we also need to reduce the number of motor vehicles out on our roads. And one of the reasons that we say is that we know that um, specifically the particulate matter, the PM 2.5, um, uh, that comes primarily from, not completely from and only from, but primarily from, uh, you know, issues surrounding, you know, tire wear and brake, brake pads and things of that nature. Um, these are incredibly bad for our health and well-being. And so to your point, you sort of alluded to it, is that, you know, the, the bike or the e-bike is a much smaller vehicle. And so the negative impacts, the negative externalities of what little bit of tire wear and what little bit of brake pad wear that we see on a bike is not even comparable to what we see on extremely heavy, uh, especially the current trend of the electric vehicles, the cars that are being built, they have very super heavy uh, electric uh, SUVs and whatnot. Um, Yeah, we need to electrify that fleet, but we also need to decrease the number of vehicles. So I I, I like to kind of emphasize that too, is that the the e-bikes and the bikes are, yes. (laughs) Yes, I would concur with that. My master's degree in college, I did a thesis associated with it looking at air quality and took several air quality, uh, air pollution control classes. So reducing particulate matter is something that I'm particularly interested in. This has a ton of negative health impacts. It increases your likelihood of stroke, increases your likelihood of heart attack. And uh, it's also just not great for the general environment. It seeps into the water as microplastic waste, and that also then proceeds to get inside of our bodies when we drink water, consume produce, for example, that was watered with this microplastic food. So e-bikes are not necessarily 100% PM 2.5 free. I don't know the exact numbers because I don't think there's been a study that looks at this, but they produce far less. It's not as heavy as you You are, you are. can, it, it would be extremely challenging for a person on their e-bike to weigh the same as a vehicle and then achieve the speeds with the stopping power required where you would see similar production of particulate matter, I would imagine. So you would see, I believe, an overall reduction in this pollutant, which would have really positive health impacts. And that's not even to get into the impact of the uh, exercise for that you would get. E-bikes are not uh, as, e-bikes are not as intensely an exercise as acoustic cycle, but that's part of why people get on them more. And uh, research has found that they are the equivalent of achieving a light workout, which for a lot of people would go very far in towards meeting the health and exercise goals that are outlined by the CDC, the Center for Disease Control. Many people really struggle to meet the 150 uh, minutes that are outlined in these re- in these recommendations. And I believe that having cities that promote the ability to bike and support that sort of infrastructure would see more people meeting those goals and seeing a reduction in diseases that are more associated with that lack of exercise. Yeah. Yeah. And the 150 they're referring to there is 150 minutes per week of light to moderate uh, physical activity. And, and you're absolutely right. And we're starting to see now that we're getting more and more people out on bikes, uh, on electric bikes, uh, that we're able to sort of evaluate and and get some estimates back that uh, in, in actuality, because it's a much more pleasurable experience and quite frankly, it's fun to uh, people are riding more. And so they they're starting to catch up to that same benefit level of just riding a normal bike uh, because they're riding more. And so they're getting more activity in and importantly, they're also much more likely to do it more frequently, more number of days of the week, hence being able to hit that 150, um, you know, minutes mark on a, on a per weekly basis. 
Yeah, I, I think it's much harder when the when you have that ability to turn on the power or use the throttle to get going at a stoplight. It's a little bit more difficult to convince yourself that you don't need a bike somewhere because you have all these mechanisms built into the bike where it's, well, this sort of alleviates some of the burden and helps me get going. So it becomes just much more of a default choice. Yeah, yeah. And you you brought up a good point there, too, is that uh, there are many different types of e-bikes. Yes, there are electric assist e-bikes, which is my preference, is uh, is a good, high quality. My preference is a a Bosch powered (laughs) electric assist bike because I know that that's a UL rated um, motor and battery system, which is much less likely to have uh, fire uh, bursting (laughs) capabilities and challenges with it. And, uh, and I do appreciate that boost to get up a steep hill, but at the same time, um, you know, if I can just tone it down a little bit and use more of my own power versus, uh, you know, using a, a, a throttle necessarily. So, um, in fact, I don't think I've ever even ridden a, a throttle bike, or if I did, I turned the throttle off because it was just like, oh, this is like a motorcycle to me. My bike has a throttle on it. Um, so I use that when I'm waiting at a stoplight, for example, to get moving because it helps me get going. Uh, because often at streetlights, you get the walk signal and the light stays red. And then there's a very short time period for you to get into the road and make sure you're visible. So for me, at least having the throttle helps with that. Uh, but I think it just really depends on the type of person, the the type of bike. I, I think it would be interesting down the line to see research on how do people use the different energy settings on their bike, right? A lot of these bikes do come with varying levels of power output. So mine has everything from eco mode, which largely offsets the weight of the bike to level one, level two, and then sports mode. Right. <laughs> I've yeah. never been in sports mode. It's a little, it's a little aggressive. Yeah, yeah. I think our, our my the Bosch system uh, has you know four main uh, systems. Uh, I think it's Eco, Tour, Sport, and Turbo. And I pretty much only use Turbo when I'm going up a really really steep hill. And boy, do I enjoy having that because it's a very very heavy cargo bike. So <laughs> that's good. So we're we're hanging out here on the um, the blog post from uh, October twelfth, uh, twenty twenty three, just this past year about the calculator. Talk a little bit about the e-bike impact calculator. Yeah. So we started developing this in May 2020 or yeah, 2022, because this was around the time that Denver had launched their e-bike incentive program. So for, I'm sure your listeners are aware of this, but Denver had a program where people could submit and get varying levels of e-bike rebate, depending on the type of bike that they were going for, as well as their income status. And Denver had a lot of other options at the time for other things such as heat pumps, for example, or more efficient windows. But the uh, it was the e-bike incentive program that ended up making the news because all the e-bike rebates got claimed within maybe five minutes, <laughs> 10 minutes, the website crashed. Uh, it was this very sudden interest in e-bikes that I think surprised a lot of people. And we looked at that and said, that's interesting. This, how are people going to use this? What is going to be the climate impact of this? So we started gathering information and we used Replica, which provides data on sort of a breakdown of how are people getting around by different types of modes within their city, right? So how many people are walking a mile versus biking a mile versus driving a mile? And then we started using that to assess, okay, well, what would be the benefits of A, shifting vehicle trips over to e-bikes overall, but also pursuing a program like Denver's. So this this calculator was created as a way to sort of demonstrate to cities the utility of e-bike, and, uh, e-bike adoption overall, so promoting a culture of e-bikes within the city, but also what would be the impact of the e-bike incentive program more broadly. So we did speak to people associated with the Denver program, such as Mike Salisbury, uh, and he actually reviewed our calculator and provided insights on, as somebody who was looking at one of these programs, what would be useful data points. So we want to assess obviously the climate impact, but also the air quality impacts. What would be the reduc- what would be the reduction in vehicle miles traveled, right? So how many miles were people biking versus driving now? And we also wanted to look at what would be the impact on uh, their personal finances. So e-bikes 
obviously do take power to charge, so they are not inherently free, even when you have a good incentive, but they are much, much cheaper per mile. And I think that that was really uh, a driving force of their interest in the summer of 2022, because gas prices were very expensive here. And especially for lower income residents, uh, that was a huge burden. If, if, you're, if you're lower income and you have a much more efficient car, you're probably feeling that difference a lot more acutely. But what we found with our modeling is that e-bikes are fractions of a penny per mile when you look at the power costs versus cars, which can be several pennies per mile, depending if it's an EV. And I think it's roughly 10 cents per mile if you are driving a gas car. And then when you add maintenance on top of that, Cars have varying levels of maintenance, right? Uh, a gas car is more complicated, so it has the Department of Energy estimates about ten cents per mile worth of maintenance costs, and obviously these get more complicated as the car gets older and parts might go out of stock. EVs tend to have roughly seven to eight cents per mile because they're more simple, but e-bikes. I mean, we still need more estimates on it, but like there's many fewer parts that are involved in an e-bike and people with some training can produce or can maintain their bike themselves. A lot of e-bike brands such as Juice, which is what my bike is, have videos up on the website of, okay, well, your tire's flat. How do you change your tire? Because you need to unplug the battery and make sure that it's still working well. So I think that that really helps people reduce the cost of maintaining a mode of transportation for these short trips. And what we found that over time is even if you're only replacing these short trips, only a portion of the year or the week, this can still save a bunch of money over time. So this can save two to $300 a year, depending on how you're doing it. And I think that this is something I'd like to model in the future. I think that it'd be interesting to see the potential for people to just not have a second car, which would obviously reduce their costs even further. I think that both of these things just show e-bikes can be really beneficial for the climate can be really beneficial for people's wallets and can be really great for their cities. And so with the e-bike calculator, we really just wanted to compile all of that data into one easy to use source so people could see what would be the value of doing it themselves. And so far, I think it's been very valuable. Uh, I I've talked to the city of Atlanta a few times who've used this calculator for their e-bike incentive program. And I've had some cities reach out to ask to be added. So I think that there is a real desire to understand what this impact would be. Yeah. And you had mentioned a, a little bit about, you know, the, the, the benefits that and the insights that were gleaned from the Denver e-bike uh, incentive program and, uh, uh, you know, astute watchers of the channel here um, know that I have produced a video on uh, the e the Denver e-bike uh, incentive program. Uh, I'll be sure to include the, the link uh, to that video here in the uh, video description down below and in the show notes. And here's some of the uh, uh, example insights that you had, uh, you know, that you meaning RMI <laughs> calculated, <laughs> including, uh, you know, the, looking at about $1 million in cumulative annual savings from the program. This is pretty exciting. You've got to be just like delighted to be working on this. I think it's a really interesting topic. Uh, I think that it provides a lot of insight into what are ways that we can help people get out of their vehicles and into other modes of transportation. Like I said, we RMI has done this analysis to show that we need to cut vehicle miles traveled in addition to electrifying. This is backed up by work that we've released recently. We released this calculator, Smarter Modes, which looks at the value of cutting vehicle miles traveled in every state of the country. And e-bikes offer a real opportunity to do that in a way that I think would provide people with a great option to save money alongside cutting their emissions. And give them a, a bit more of a sense of their city. I, that's hard to claim because obviously there's not research on it, but there is so much research out there that says e-bikes can potentially help reduce noise pollution, that e-bikes can help people get exercise, that e-bikes can reduce air quality. And it is very empowering to have work that shows we can not only help people achieve this goal of driving less, but do so in a way that will make their lives better. Yeah. Yeah. And for anybody listening or, or watching this and, and are like screaming at your screens or or at your uh, your listening device and going, yeah, but what about regular bikes? No, no, no. We get it, guys. We get it. Your, your, your regular bike 
gets all of that and more. Uh, but what we're re- really talking about here is reducing those v- that VMT. We're trying to shift, you know, more and more people considering that, hey, you know, if I've got a safe route to many of these short trips, these meaningful destinations that we need to make, what better way than to jump on the bike? And if the e-bike makes that much more likely for you to do it, then thumbs up to that. Yeah, and I think it goes back to that that idea around inclusion, right? So again, vehicles leave out a lot of people who can't drive or won't drive for a multitude of reasons. And I there's a lot of people obviously who might struggle with biking, but there's a whole host of modified bikes that can accomplish these needs and that I've been increasingly seeing electrified, right? So trike or not truck, uh uh, Rad Power had that electric tricycle that I've seen people ride around on, which looks great. There's the, uh, and I believe that Colorado has a e-bike rebate for the modified bikes for people who might need to recline while they're biking as well. And this, I think, just overcomes the barrier for people who would worry about their own relative strength, right? Acoustic bikes are great. I have several because I live in Boulder and I think it's just a requirement, but it is. I, I, I very think you. Yeah, I think you. I think you get your your notice of like you know if if you haven't like n plus one added another one in a certain number of months they're like hey you know you might lose your Boulder Pass. <laughs> yeah, there's some there's some things you just have to do to live in Boulder. Like you have to drink kombucha. <laughs> you have to drink kombucha and you have to own a bike. <laughs> I think e bikes are great because. I think especially like as you were saying earlier, people bike more. And I think when you bike a regular acoustic bike regularly, it's impossible to imagine being in the mindset of somebody who is hesitant around biking, who worries about their ability to keep up or if they'll be okay. And I've, I've seen people with like some level of injury be able to bike in a way that's still safe. For example, my partner has a knee injury that uh, has taken a while to heal and when we're biking somewhere, he's able to use a higher power setting on his bike and use the pedal assist to still be able to bike. And that's really important because sometimes what you need with those injuries is just that low pressure exercise to be able to help them heal and to get around. And I think that e-bikes also importantly allow people to exist without a car. I do know people who have sold a car because they've gotten two e-bikes or people who don't have a car because they have e-bikes and that probably saves them a lot of money and allows them first of all more choices on where to live because they don't then have to worry about parking so much and it allows them to have a bit more flexibility in their budget because they're not paying for car insurance or gas or fueling or whatever the the various associated costs are yeah I like to refer to uh, my bikes as my mobility devices. It's just, it's a way for me to be able to go further than I would probably be able to comfortably go just walking. It's a pedestrian accelerator. Oh, yeah, most definitely. I don't live terribly far from a grocery store. I live about a mile and a half. But when I forget to buy something, it's much easier to convince myself to go run out and grab it on the bike versus if I drive, I have to like, first of all, find my car keys. Um, And then secondly, go get in the car and then drive in a weird convoluted pattern and make sure to avoid that pothole that I know is there that I haven't reported to the city yet. Then I have to find a parking spot. Then I have to, to get my bag versus my bike path to the grocery store is actually mostly off the road very easy i only cross the road at one point pull right up in front of it because the bike rack's right by the door just grab my pannier lock up and then walk in uh it for me at this point due to my own experiences and my own setup with having biked for most of my life rather than driven the the cognitive load of having to drive just feels so much more challenging yeah yeah is there anything that we haven't discussed yet that you want to make sure to leave the audience with in this uh, context of the uh, the bikes and the e-bikes and the e-bike calculator. Do you want to discuss sort of what we see as the future of biking and e-biking in the country? Yes, go for it. I think definitely the, the, the great thing about Denver is we're seeing a lot more interest in adopting these programs. And I think that one of the great things that's also come out of Denver is there's been a lot of work there now that they have this amazing program that's really getting, that's really shown people want to bike and are going to bike. 
they're now building out the infrastructure to make it safer for people to do so. And I think that that's a great example for cities looking at following suit. And this is, I think, a really valuable thing to be doing at this point. We're in an era where car loans are pretty expensive due to rising insurance rates. So a lot of people, I think, would struggle with needing to buy a car, even with uh, various incentives, it would be pretty challenging. But getting an e-bike with an e-bike incentive offers them the ability to start saving money and electrifying their trips now, dramatically reducing their emissions and cutting back. And I believe potentially too, if they're doing that, if they have that that ability to save and that ability to use a safe means of electric transportation, they would then be able to save for a safe, reliable electric vehicle to replace an older car because they would not be as hindered by fluctuating gas prices. Again, it's not going to like replace all your trips, but it can replace a good number of them, which can add up to a couple of hundred dollars per year, depending on what you do, or even more if you're able to drop down from two cars to one car and two e-bikes. And that really provides an option to, I think, provide some financial stability to people and allow them to consider what modes of transportation do they want moving forward, what works best for them, what allows them to get around safely, to engage with their city, and then they have the space to mentally plan and and think about what are the things they want to be doing next. Yeah. And you sort of uh, alluded to this uh, graphic uh, earlier in in talking about the fact that, yeah, what we're really talking about here, we're, we're not talking about trying to build out the network for, you know, the the highly competent sport riders and recreation riders. We're really looking at that vast majority of the population that would ride more frequently if it was safe to do so. And we call those, and we have been calling those ever since Roger Geller uh, first did this, this research out of Portland, uh, the interested yet concerned part of the population where you know, they would ride more if it felt safe to do so. And that's a really big opportunity of getting more than just, you know, that that one to five percent of of the population that would will ride, uh, you know, regardless of the facilities that are there and the environment that's out there. So that's a really big opportunity that we have. Yeah. In RMI's work, we put all the numbers in the calculator on the weekly level because we wanted to make the point of you don't have to do this all year round, right? It would be incredibly challenging to bike in Minnesota in the middle of winter, I presume. It's presumably very challenging to bike in Florida or Arizona in the middle of summer. But if you are only able to do this for roughly six months of the year, that still has tremendous potential to save people money, to cut this emissions. And to uh, just to help people get that exercise in and cut their transportation emissions overall, I think can often feel like we're prescribing it as this is something that needs to be done 24 seven all the time. But I think that it's one of those things that like, as you can do it, it will be a benefit for many different aspects of the world and your own personal life. Yeah. And you mentioned that you're really talking about these things in terms of that weekly sort of view. And uh, we see the the top 10 uh, cities in terms of the size of population on here. And as we can see, my current city of Austin, Texas is in the number 10 spot. And yeah, this is exactly what the city of, of Austin is really working towards is, hey, how can we, um, you know, off shift some of those very bikeable distance you know, trips to something other than a single occupancy vehicle. Can we get pe- more people walking to their meaningful destinations? Can we get more people riding a bike and taking transit, you know, to their destinations? And we can see here that, uh, you know, there's a nice little uh, opportunity when we look at 47% of our uh, trips, you know, from zero to five miles. And I would even say that, you know, when we start to look at the power of a little bit of an electric assist boost, you start, you know, creeping your way up into the five plus because suddenly, you know, one of my, my trips that I frequently ride to is like seven and a half, eight miles away. And I don't even bat an eye. I would never drive on that trip, but I know that it's that much more, uh, feasible and comfortable. Oh, and by the way, because I have a safe and inviting all ages and abilities network to ride on, which you guys, uh, reference in, in, in channel, uh, the Dutch cycling embassy and the cycling infrastructure, it's a great equalizer 
to the weather. Because when I know I've got a safe and inviting environment to ride in, I know that I can you know, create a little bit of my wind and be able to, you know, enjoy that trip, even though it's like 107 degrees out, which we get here in Texas. <laughs> Yeah, I think that states are states and cities are showing a lot of creativity and I think strength in moving forward on how they want to do this. I'm very excited to see what Denver continues to do, for example, with their program. And I do want to say this, too, about winter, because, uh, you know, obviously in Denver and in, in Colorado and in Boulder uh, and you mentioned Minneapolis in the wintertime. Yeah, I mean, these are cold places. These could be very snowy places. Hopefully they will continue to be snowy places. Um but yeah, people still ride in these environments if they have a safe place to ride, if they have a safe network. And one of the profiles that I absolutely loved uh, doing a couple years ago was on Olu, Finland, that has an, an extensive off-street network of pathways. And, you know, they're very close to the Arctic Circle. And so what they do is they just have a, a very fastidious uh, path maintenance program that helps texturize the the snow, the packed snow, so that's gr- nice and grippy on the tires, and they ride all year round. In fact, the kids ride to school at like uh, some astounding rate of sixty to seventy percent of kids ride their bike to school every single day. It's just a, it's just amazing through the dead of winter. Yeah, Boulder uh, has great programs for in the winter. They often scrape off the off the road bike paths before they do the main road. So, which is great for me because when I go into the office, I am mostly on off the road bike paths. But with cold, it's often you just, you need a a good coat, you need gloves, you need a face mask. And it is fairly possible because once you get moving, you warm up pretty well. Our, Our bodies are pretty good at stabilizing our internal temperature when faced with cold. Yeah. And just to give some love to Boulder too, since you grew up in Boulder, it is one of the places in North America where I have documented uh, over and over and over again, just incredibly high rates of kids walking and biking to school. You know, some of my favorite middle schools are like the Centennial uh, Middle School and the Casey Middle School. You go there and their their bike racks have got hundreds and hundreds of bikes, you know, parked out there. So uh, it can happen, folks, if you're you're in a car centric place like in North America city here uh, or down in Australia, New Zealand, down under, it can happen. And, and really the magic piece to all of this is creating that safe inviting network so that, you know, all ages and all abilities can to get to their meaningful destinations. Well said. Yeah, that's my hope moving forward is that a lot of people will have that option to get to 21 and then sort of decide, eh, maybe I should get my driver's license rather than having it be something that you have to do if you want to go see your friends. Yeah. Bryn, this has been so much fun. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you so much for having me. This has been great. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Bren. And if you did, please, hey, give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. And if you're enjoying this content, please consider supporting my efforts out on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks and buying things from the Active Town store. I've always got good stuff out there, like, you know, some good streets are for people swag. Uh, And you can also make a donation to the nonprofit. You can access all of that out at my website at activetowns.org. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. It means so much to me. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.